Hello and welcome to episode 27 of the DX Mentor, H40WA expedition to Tamutu. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bill, AJB, the DX Mentor. The Intrepid DX Group is currently QRV from Tamutu Province until March 7. So possibly while you're watching this, they'll still be active. Tamutu is number 45 on the club log most wanted DXCC list, but I suspect it's going to be falling fast. Paul, N6PSE, and Rob, N7QT, are the team co-leaders. I'm thrilled to tell you that we have Paul, N6PSE, on this episode to tell us all about his preparation for the D-Expedition. Joe, WADGEX, also a veteran of 60 D-Expeditions, will be with us. I received an excellent email from Greg, KM5GT. Greg was commenting on the CQ uh, Marathon episode that we had recently. It seems that our discussion lit a fire under Greg, and he's off and running. Congratulations to you, Greg, on the success you've already achieved this year, and please let me know if you need any help. We have some sad news from the DX community. Bob Heil, K9EID, founder of Heil Communications, passed away. I had the opportunity to meet Bob at the Dayton Hamvention many years ago. I was simply buying a foot switch at their booth, and I happened to ask the guy at the end of the table about it. What a great conversation we had about all things ham radio. And yes, the foot switch as well. Here's what was posted on the How Communications Facebook page. Quote, today we say goodbye to our beloved founder, Dr. Bob Heil. Bob fought a valiant year-long battle with cancer and passed peacefully surrounded by his family. Bob's impact on professional and live sound cannot be overstated. Driven by a lifelong passion for sound, Bob's pioneering work revolutionized how concert goers experience live sound. Bob created and developed numerous pro sound innovations and products over the years, some of which are preserved in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum. In 2007, Bob was the recipient of the Audio Innovator Parnelli Award, recognizing his outstanding influence on the live sound and industry. Countless artists, creators, broadcasters, podcasters, sound engineers, and sound professionals worldwide continue to be impacted by Bob's work. While Bob's presence will be dearly missed, we are immensely proud and happy to honor and carry on his legacy, end quote. Bob will definitely be missed by the Ham and DX community. So now, let's learn about the H40WA expedition to Tumutu Province. Well, hello, and welcome to the latest edition of the DX Mentor Podcast. Um, I'm Bill, AJ8B, your host. Um, and tonight, we're really excited to be talking about an upcoming DX expedition. Uh, this is a first for us. We always catch them when they're getting off the boat. Um, now we're going to try to catch them before they get on the boat. Um, <laughs> and Paul's going to be doing a ton of traveling the next couple of months. He'll share that with us a little bit. But uh, to get us started, it always let me uh, introduce Joe, and then we'll have Paul introduce himself. So, Joe, go ahead. Well, good evening, guys. Nice to be a part of the podcast again, uh, Bill. I think this is what, maybe number 25. Yep. But in a way, uh, I've been a ham for 53 years, been a DXer uh, all my uh, my whole life. Started off in 1970 and went up through, uh, through the ranks pretty much, got my general, my um, advance, and then, then the extra. Been on... Uh, Quite a few D expeditions. Some of them were uh, just by myself, one man deal, and been on some where fifteen and twenty operators were involved. So uh, pretty much a DXer, and of course we have the big DX man with us tonight. So uh, welcome aboard, Paul. Thank you, Joe. It's good to be with both of you tonight. Thank you. And Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this. A, a how you got into DX. And then B, how you got into uh, all this travel and chase and uh, being DX. Okay, I'm coming to you tonight from San Jose, California, where I was born and raised. Uh, I was licensed uh, in 1982 uh, as a uh, Tech Plus initially, and I upgraded to uh, to Extra uh, some years later. Um, I started out as a VHF and UHF guy and eventually became a DXer and enjoyed uh HF quite a bit. And then I saw all these guys having fun traveling to exotic locations and setting up antennas on the beach and, and doing uh, really great things with radio. And I said, I want to be a part of that. And I uh, started asking around, you know, how does one get involved? How do you get invited to go on a D expedition? I found it kind of challenging to 
break into it. So I just decided to organize my own de-expedition. Um, that was in April 2010. Um, we happened to be involved in a war in Iraq, and I learned uh, from uh, from some soldiers that there was a very safe and friendly area in Iraq called Kurdistan. And uh, here on the West Coast, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, soldiers that were 100 watts in a wire from Iraq. The work of them from the West Coast was really tough, nearly impossible. So uh, my initial goal was to uh, to help my buddies in W6 land and and go there with some amplifiers and Yagi antennas and, you know, put out some big signals. And it just sort of evolved. I was very fortunate to befriend uh, Dave Collingham, K3LP, uh, now a silent key. He guided me, mentored me, became one of my dearest friends. And um, he was very instrumental in making uh, YI9PSC very successful de-expedition, 54,000 QSOs. And then from there, we we just became extremely close and we uh, went to a whole bunch of places together. And sadly, he's a silent key now. Yeah, that I, I don't know um, if a DX dinner meeting at some point doesn't go by and we don't talk about Dave. Uh, he had won the grand prize at Vizalian and turned around and won the grand prize like a month later at our dinner. And it was mm -hmm. I wanted to follow him around hoping he'd play the lottery. But what, you're, you're right. What a great guy. And, and Yeah. And you yeah. know what he did with those grand prizes? He immediately gave those away to kids that needed those rigs. He, yes. he didn't keep anything for himself. Yes. He, he always paid it forward. That's that's terrific. I I, had, I was fortunate enough to meet him, and uh, um, even in like one or two meetings, all of a sudden it's kind of like, well, if you guys are willing to do this, we could ship these PCs over to Africa, and they could use them at this one town. I know it was like he just always had those ideas. So, yeah. uh, well, he, he's missed, and uh, and I'm glad that you're carrying on, and uh, and we all appreciate everything you do. I do remember my first um, encounter with you was you had a blog that I enjoyed the heck out of, and I had commented on it several times, and then you stopped, and I, I think uh, there were a few people that didn't necessarily agree with your view, maybe, um, and <laughs> yeah. you got tired of hearing about it, and so I, I personally was sorry for that, because I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was it was uh, fun. It was a passion of mine. Um, all the time, I think about resuming it, but I remember, uh, you know, when you put your your thoughts and sort of your heart and soul out there on the internet, there's always a very small but vocal crowd that just really sort of, you know, goes after you. You know, they're they're kind of like the the dogs it used to chase me when I was a paper boy, always trying to bite me. And it just, yeah. you know, it's just sort of like I really don't need that. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Uh, so what does what what are some of the expeditions? You're, you're obviously a very experienced expeditioner. What are some of the ones you went on that came to mind? Would, would come to wow. mind if somebody says, "What was your best or most favorite?" Or, well, my 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 most favorite was probably my worst. But uh, <laughs> we uh, in 2016, Dave Collingham and I brought a team of 13 men, and we went to uh, South Sandwich in South Georgia, VP8 STI and VP8 SGI. That was a really tough de expedition. It tested us uh, physically, tested us emotionally. We all found our limits. We were cold. We were hungry. Um, I would argue that activating South Sandwich is right up there with activating Bouvet. It was really, really a very tough place. And if it wasn't for the uh, the hardy crew of the Braveheart uh, who, who got us there and took good care of us while we were there, we probably wouldn't have been so successful. But uh, that was probably the most difficult de-expedition, but uh, my favorite for a lot of ways. And it was the last one that I was able to do with K3LP. I, I think, I believe that's the one that uh, Jay, K4ZLE was on. That's right. Yep. And, and he's a member of our club. And I can remember him telling us about a particular night where the tent, it was everything they could do to hold the tent down to keep you guys from literally being blown off the glacier. That's a night I'll never forget. The, the wind was just howling and, and nobody got any sleep that night. We literally were standing with our backs to the tent, hold, just holding it in place. We were afraid that the wind was just going to lift it and send it sailing off into the ocean. And then we would have been extremely uh, vulnerable to the elements. Uh, um, 
we spent a lot of time securing that tent and just tying it down more and more and more and more. It, uh, wow. That was a scary night. I, uh, I, uh, um, yeah, that just uh, that really affected me. Yeah. So Paul, Paul, did Jay or, or one of your crew members fall in the water on that trip? Or am I thinking of something else? Uh, no, we had a generator that got it was it was coming off the small boat and a wave went over the generator. Um, and, you know, everybody jumped in and grabbed it. We all got a little bit wet, but it wasn't sure. too bad. But no, nobody, uh, nobody fell in the water. OK, OK. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like to bring stuff like that up, not to kind of, you know, raise bad memories or. But there's there's so many of us, you know, I've not done anything like that. So for me, if I get you in the log, I'm excited. And then I go listen for the next one. And if I don't, I get frustrated and I go listen for the next one. And we don't think about the fact that there's three weeks in getting there. There's three weeks in, after you're tearing it down. You're taking care of all this stuff that's been loaned to you that you're responsible for. And a lot of times you're in, you know, you're really uh, you're putting your life at risk. So um, that, that's a message I like. I, I want listeners and viewers to kind of take away that these aren't just you hop in a boat and you go work somewhere. There's a lot involved. Yeah, you know, and as a leader organizer, we we do a lot of risk mitigation. We look at all of the risks. We constantly assess and reassess the risk. And we do everything we can to minimize the risk because you know, the goal is uh, uh, to do a safe and productive de-expedition, to have everybody come home. Hopefully, everybody will have had a good time. Um, hopefully, our audience, the DX community, will be satisfied with our effort. Um, but, yeah, we try to minimize risk as much as we can. That's that's a primary goal for us. Well, um, one of the things that's also come up in one of our podcasts was how important it is to have a doctor on on the trip. Um, and Joe, Absolutely, and Joe, especially when you're, you know, days away from civilization, and you know somebody could have something uh, like a appendicitis attack that you know could be devastating if you're seven or eight days away from civilization, and and you know it's a, it's, a, it's that long of a boat ride to get back. Um, so it's very very important to have a physician on the team. Um, and, and I really think that any organizer that doesn't include a, a physician on their team and they're they're going to a very remote place, I think they're remiss. I think they're negligent. They really need to yes. dig deeper and work harder. There are physicians that are willing and able and want to go. So you who's your physician uh, on Clipperton, Paul? Uh, that's uh, Arliss Thompson, W7XU, who was yeah. also with us for South Sandwich, South Georgia. Great guy, a retired ER uh, physician, and a wonderful ham amateur and a wonderful human being. So I know you're not the leader of Clipperton, uh, but you are going. So can you just tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, we've got a huge team. Uh, we'll be uh, departing uh, San Diego. I think it's uh, January 10th on the Shogun. And I think it's about a six, seven day voyage to Clipperton. We'll be setting up, and boy, the plans are huge. We have, uh, they're doing EME, uh, six meters, uh, you know, everything down to uh, 160 meters. Um, really good equipment, really good planning, very good organization, and it should be really, really effective. Uh, that a lot of people should be able to get contacts with Clipperton. We hope you know see everybody in our logs. Wow. So it's, it's a big, almost, big effort. The way, the way you guys are doing these nowadays, it's like if 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 I can't get you in the log, I'm not trying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know the the wants and desires of the DX community has changed. I remember when I was first a DXer, I was satisfied to just get one contact. When Peter One Island was on, you know, so many years ago, I have one SSB contact, and I thought that was great. You know, now I'm retired, and I chase. Uh, D expeditions on every band and mode that I can, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very challenging, um, you know. Um, I've I've come around to really covet, you know, one sixty and eighty meter QSOs. Uh, uh, they're hard. That's very challenging. You know, people say, "Why do you do it?" Because it's, it's really hard, but it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm really uh, I don't miss the not in log days. 
You know, I no, mean, no. Oh, and, and you either had to do insurance contacts, or, which were never guaranteed, or you just rolled yeah. the dice and, oh, what a devastating yeah. letter that things, is. To get things back. are better now in a lot of ways. I love Club Log. I love those daily uh, uploads. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the live, live streaming. I think uh, that's counterproductive uh, um, because of the, the internet connections falter and then people think they've got to do it because they don't see their call flash up. But I like the daily once a day club log upload. I think that's really great. Sure. And, you know, Starlink has enabled that to be a lot more easier and, and reliable. So I think that's a really great thing. Huh. Very good. So after Clipperton, you're, you're coming home for a long time for rest and relaxation. And then where are you going? I'm coming home and I'm for about a week and then I'm <laughs> heading off to the Solomon Islands and uh, we'll be in uh, uh, the capital of Solomon's Honiara for about five days waiting for our once a week flight to Lom Lom in Tomotu province. And then we're going to take a, a small boat to a, a small island called Pigeon Island and we'll operate there for two weeks as H40WA. Okay. And Tomotu's the number 43 most wanted entity. So, Wow. Now, how many folks are going to be on that? Uh, we've got eight to uh, eight people. Um, that's the limit that the aircraft, there's a small aircraft that flies from Haniera to Lom Lom, and they can only take eight people. So that's the limit of our team. And it's only once a week flight. So, mm -hmm. so uh, it's going to be a small team, but we're going to hit it hard. Uh, we've got big plans, a lot of gear. We shipped uh, thousands of pounds of equipment. Uh, and it's there waiting for us. So uh, we're excited and we're ready to go. So as, as the team leader, can you give us a glimpse of, uh, that just sounds daunting to me. You got to put all these stations together. You got to get food and fuel. How, how do you, how do you even start that? Well, it has been challenging. Um, but, you know, first you assemble your team and, and, you know, you always sort of have a bench of people that are interested and available and willing to go. Um, and you, you scale, you, you have to know your limits. You, so you scale your plan. So we're going to have four stations, one of which will primarily be a reserve and we'll do some six meter work with that one, but we'll have three stations active around the clock with eight guys. They're going to be very, very busy. It's not going to be a lot of time on the beach, but eight guys can keep three stations uh, active around the clock uh, in pretty good fashion. Um, now, if we, ha you know, had the luxury of 14, 15, 18 guys, we could have more stations, obviously, but uh, but it would it just wouldn't make sense to bring more than four stations for such a small team. But we'll, so, um, you know, we'll we'll pay close attention to uh, our pilots who will be communicating to us uh, over a satellite uh, messenger device. Uh, the Garmin inReach uh, about, uh, you know, the needs and, and, you know, where we're hitting and where we need to be and we'll be in constant contact with them. So uh, we hope to satisfy, you know, the greater good out there. We hope to make everybody happy. So do you stage your equipment ahead? I'm, I'm surely you don't just show up and say, oh yeah. Uh, so you must stage this ahead of time, then you repack it and yeah, back in July, we completed acquiring all of our gear, and, and we had quite a bit of gear here in storage, but we uh, we get everything out, refurbish it, test it, make sure it's good. We pack it in July. We worked with a logistics company here in the Bay Area to ship it to uh, the Solomon Islands, and um, from there, it's been moved around on various uh, smaller ships and ferry boats to get to Tomotu. Um so, so everything was packed and shipped and tested, and and it's there waiting for us. So we're very, we have a very small amount of gear that we need to to bring with us. You know, things like uh, things like an extra laptop, uh, uh, antenna analyzer, that kind of thing. But most of it's there waiting. So we're in good shape. So, Paul, how many people live on the island, if any? Uh, on Pigeon Island, where we're going, it's just a, a very, very small family, sort of a caretaker family. Okay. It has a, a small guest house uh, on the island. And um, where we've arranged for generators to be brought in and drums of fuel. And uh, so uh, it's just going to be us. Yeah. Well, so we, we hope that that helps with the noise situation. We hope yeah. that we have low noise because there's really isn't anybody 
close by. Well, so Joe, would you mind sharing your barrel connector story? Because when I when I when I think about logistics and and what you guys and and what Joe's been through, what you've been through multiple times, this story always resonates with me because this would be me. I'm telling you right now, this would be me. <laughs> so I'm like you, Paul. I'm I'm very uh, good about details. So we was on um, we were going to Midway. And, uh, of course, we had all the radios and all the cables and everything. And we get on Midway, and, and we're running all, all the cables. We had a mile of cable. And, and I'm sure you guys are taking probably about the same amount. And usually we're at least two or 300 feet from, you know, from the water line. So we start putting cables together, and we had no barrel connectors, not a one. So as, as luck would have it, uh, uh, Charlie, um, I'm brain dead, NF4A and uh, uh, Bruce Butler had to stay back in, in Honolulu because our plane was full and they was bringing a next flight in the next morning. So we called those guys and told them while they're in Honolulu, rent a, a taxi and go to every radio shack in Honolulu and buy every uh, barrel connector that they could get. So by God, those two guys did that. We met them at the airport on uh, Midway and uh, they had all these barrel connectors, but without those guys being there, I guess we would have just cut that coax and, and tied the ends together. What else would you do? So uh, that I was thinking about that as, as well. Uh, Bill, when we was talking about logistics and planning of all this, and you cannot be uh, too sharp on that. You really got to get down to the right. pencil and, and think, what have we got? Have we missed anything? Because that thing that you're missing might be just the important thing that you need. Yeah, we've learned the hard way that, uh, you know, Murphy always comes with us. If whatever <laughs> can go wrong, will go wrong. We have to plan for every contingency. We have multiple checklists and we have to check things two, three, four times. And inevitably there's always something we kind of wish we had. You cannot have enough black tape, just yeah. <laughs> black yeah. tape and tie wraps. You cannot have too much of that. No, no. <laughs> so what made, what made you choose uh, Timotu? I mean, there's, you know, there's a number of places I suppose you could have gone. Was there, was there anything in, you know, specific or was it hey this is a cool uh, not a cool place but it meets a lot of our goals and objectives so let's go there well um we have spent an awful lot of time and effort uh trying to get permission for all of the u.s fish and wildlife possessions in the south pacific um we've had numerous discussions with them we've submitted uh supplemental use permits for everything out there and we're just getting nowhere and no no uh ray of hope really uh uh i don't believe that permission will ever be given for johnston island for example uh curie no not gonna happen no. um the others maybe but uh we're kind of tired of staying home and tomotu is one of the easier uh islands that you can get permission for it's maybe not as rare as some of the ones that we'd really like to activate but those those rare ones are rare for a reason they really they just don't want us there so uh we could stay home and keep focusing on the the, the super tough ones or we can go out and have some fun on a semi-rare one and that's the case with tomotu so Paul, uh, talking about that the um rig in a box do you think that's going to be beneficial for those um, fish and wildlife locations? First of all, I want to say that I think the rig in a box is very, very cool. It's it's neat technology. Uh, George Walner has done a masterful job in assembling all that technology and putting it in a box. That said, I'm skeptical that will help. And the reason why is when I talk to fish and wildlife people, they tell me that their primary concerns are bird strikes with antennas, uh, people peeing and pooping on the island, 
storage and handling of fuel on the island mm -hmm. um, and people camping on the island. Well, the rib in a box or the radio in a box mitigates camping on the island. Um, you can tell people not to pee and poop on the island, but if they got to, they're probably going to. So you can't guarantee that's not going to happen. The bird strikes, the, the rib doesn't do a thing to help you with bird strikes. And then I, I see the 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 uh, vehicle that George has created where he can just motor it from the magnet and drive it right up on the beach. And I, I got to think that fish and wildlife would lose their mind if they saw that because they're concerned with the turtle eggs that are just inches under the surface of the sand. And they don't want any kind of vehicle or anything of significant weight that's going to crush those turtle eggs. So uh, I think it remains to be seen um, if, uh, if the rib concept is going to help or not. I, I think, you know, it's not my decision. Right. Sure. Yeah. Wow. I hadn't thought about it from that standpoint. It seemed to me like a good fit, but I hadn't, you know, yeah. didn't think about those details. So I never thought about the turtles. I didn't either. No. Yeah, because you've dealt with bird strikes before, right, Joe, with all the the ties that you put on the wires. and Yeah, when we went to Midway, uh, guys, <clears throat> excuse me, we had to, uh, all the verticals, uh, we, we had to uh, put ribbons probably every foot. And, and in our QSL card, it made a beautiful picture of the, of the big 80 and 160 verticals and all these flags on them. But it, it took a lot of time to put those up and take them down. Mm -hmm. And of course, obviously, you had to clean the mess up and 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 the tape. And um, so, yeah, that's that's interesting. But I never thought about those turtles. No. Yeah. So do you have goals for this? I think goals are a dangerous thing because you set expectations for the ham community. And, and it sounds like you're incredibly well prepared and staffed and everything, but you still don't know what's going to happen i mean so if you announce that you're going to do two hundred thousand, everybody's excited and some reason you do 80 i mean 80 would be a tremendous you, but you see what i'm saying you just you want to be careful about setting expectations but i'm sure you also have some goals where you're going to sit back and say you know what we did it well we did it right yeah you know i've 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 learned never to say we're going to make x number of cusos because you just really don't know you don't know what you don't know um, our goals are to, you know, uh, satisfy everybody, you know, to, to satisfy the greater good. Uh, Tomotu con contacts are very coveted in Europe. Um, uh, and, you know, the East Coast uh, definitely is going to want those low band uh, contacts. We, we aim to please. Um, but uh, I, I sort of feel that it's safe to sort of under promise and over deliver. Um, you know, when we went to South Sandwich in South Georgia, I mean, the conditions there were brutal, just the winds, the just everything, you know, and, and, you know, we were only permitted to be on each island for eight days. Um, we wanted to be there longer, but, but the, the, the government uh, that issued the landing permits said, you know, in the meantime, between storms, there is eight is seven or eight days. And, we knew we got walloped in each D expedition. Basically, as we were kind of getting close to the end, we got walloped with storms that basically shut us down. So um, under promise and over deliver has worked for us. So, you know, we made 135,000 CUSOs between South Sandwich and South Georgia. So, um, you know, we over delivered there. Um, nobody expected us to make that many. And uh, I'll be happy if we can, you know, make quite a few from Tomotu. Well, That's you know what? So we'll get together when you get back mm -hmm. and then you can sit back and have a cigar and say, it was great. And here's all the reasons. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That so, would be nice. <laughs> so if I've got, uh, we've got some young DXers and I've gotten emails from them and, and, you know, they're in the, uh, there's a couple I'm thinking of right now. They're in that 60 to 70 confirmed and they're mm -hmm. aggressively moving up. Um, what are they going to have to have and, and, and what coaching would you give them to make sure that they get you in the log? You know, I think uh, I think a lot of DXers need to really examine sort of their mindset because after every D expedition, I get emails from people saying, "I heard you, but you didn't work me." Um, 
you know, or, or I never heard you, you know, you know, and all I can say is, you know, we brought a KW and a, a gain antenna, you know, and I want to tell these guys out there with a hundred Watts and a wire, Hey, we love you, but if it's coming down to the end and you're not in a log, go visit a friend or, you know, uh, your Elmer, what have you do what you got to do to get in the, in the log, because it's getting more difficult and more expensive to make these activations. And who knows what it will be like 10, 12, 15 years from now. Um, and so I, I, I tell people, you know, by hook or crook, do what you can to get in the log. And if you have to go visit your buddy's contest station or what have you, go do it. There's no shame in that. Yeah. And, and, and you got to yeah. be in the chair. I mean, you can't yeah. just throw the yeah. radio on and you guys are going to appear. Yeah, exactly. I've exactly. had guys come to uh, come to my house, Paul, that uh, their antennas were down or mm -hmm. something was broke and they, they needed to work these, uh, this D expedition. And they called me up and said, hey, can we come over? We're sure. Yep. And, yep. More guys know, should do exactly that. Yeah. Share and, your station. I do the same thing. I had five or six guys come over to my place to work Crozet and, and about as many to come and work Bouvet. Um, and from Whiskey Six Land, that was really, really tough. Yeah. And um, Jay, that you know, he was one of them. His, uh, his antenna was down and he called and I said, well, sure, buddy, come on over. It's all yours. Yeah, there's no shame in doing that. I tell guys, do what you can to get in that log. Yeah. You know, and if you have to visit a buddy or an Elmer, do it. Yeah. yeah good I, advice. Yeah, it is good advice. So um, from a from a fundraising standpoint, which is something that everybody just, I think, glosses over, but th these are these are not cheap. So what what can the folks listening? How can they help? Uh, yeah. So we uh, we're we're fundraising for the H forty WAD expedition. We've got the club log uh, PayPal link on our website, um, and we're encouraging uh, any donors of ten dollars or more. Uh, if you donate before the D expedition starts. You don't need to use the online QRS system to get your contacts confirmed. We will automatically upload to Logbook of the World and we will automatically send your QSL cards to you. So it's very, very convenient. We wow. hope that the convenient sake uh, helps people uh, donate up front. I, I, I'll share with you that the climate right now I, I talked to several other D expedition leaders that are fundraising right now. Uh, since three Y zero J, DXers are more reluctant to donate up front, and they and they they will tell us. I I'll I'm gonna wait and donate when I see I'm in the lock. Understandable. Yeah. So the climate now is not the way it was, 2021 2022. It's it's much different now. Um. But, you know, we tell guys, you know, a very small donation, $10, um, you know, um, and we want you to have fun chasing us. Isn't that fun worth, you know, $10? And again, we're going to use our postage. We're going to have our cards printed and, and we'll send it to you. We'll do logbook, everything, $10. It's, you know, and and I often feel like, you know, there's there's a a significant group of guys that are very generous. If you look at all the donors on every D expedition website, you see the same names. There's guys that donate a hundred or 500 for every D expedition. And then there's a lot of guys that sit back and donate nothing. You know, they wait for their bureau card. You know, they wait that for that year period where they get the logbook of the world upload for free. I always say, you know, if everybody donated, Ten dollars to every D expedition, maybe maybe more for the Bouvets and the Crozets and the really expensive ones. But if everybody donated ten dollars, you would have so much DX, just like we've had in the last six months. It's been really amazing. It's really this was a great year for D expeditions, and um, that can continue. You know, if if everybody helps out just a small amount, nothing nothing uh, significant, but just a, a small amount. And um, there'll be a lot more de expeditions happening. I believe that. You know that that's a heck that's a heck of a deal because by the time I put 
a card in an envelope, $2 postage or $4 green stamps or something. I mean, so basically I'm, I'm only doubling that, right. To, to make a donation to help you guys out. So right. that's, that's terrific. And it's automatic. It's guaranteed. If you get in the log, it's going to happen. It's not like you have to remember to go back and, and, you know, upload your log to club log or what have you and follow up and do it. It's just, it's, it's just a no brainer. All you have to do is get in the log. That's a great, so, go ahead, Joe. So Paul, what's your uh, website for our listeners so that they know where to donate? It is uh, uh, HTTP colon slash slash intrepid dash DX dot com slash H four zero W A. And I will put that in the show notes. So Thank you. Somebody's Thank driving and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, that's really, a, that's a deal. So Paul, what kind of antennas uh, are you going to have? We've got some really dynamite um, vertical dipole arrays that uh, my co-leader Rob and 7 qt and some of his friends have assembled. Those will be right at the water's edge on the beach. We've also got a uh, hex beam as sort of a backup directional antenna. Um, we've got uh, spider beam poles for 30, 40, 60, 80, and 160. And we've got a four element uh, six meter beam okay. for six meters. Sure. What about 60 meters? <laughs> yeah, we've... Uh, so we've got a spider beam pole. Um, we've also, we're bringing one of those uh, DX commander antennas that's sort of a, a supplemental antenna. It's gonna have 60 and 80 meters on it as well. Okay. Cause Rob would tell you that I'm a big 60 meter guy. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we aim to please. <laughs> that's good. That's, thank you. So so you mentioned that in the URL uh, that you gave, uh, it was the Intrepid DX Group. Yes. I've, I've heard that term, but I can't say I know a whole lot about it. And and I got to tell you, for all the stuff y'all doing, I want to learn more about it. So what can you tell us? Okay. So back in uh, 2010, um, we took a group and we went to uh, Iraq and made 54,000 QSOs from there. And there was a war going on at the time and a lot of, lot of uh, craziness going on in Iraq. And people called us those intrepid DXers and the name kind of stuck. Uh, then in 2011, we went to South Sudan uh, and did ST0R as they were becoming a new country. And um, people continued to call us the, you know, those intrepid DXers and the name just kind of stuck we had to sort of formalize our group because we, we, I made the mistake of using my PayPal account for uh, the first few D expeditions. And I, I ended up having to pay taxes on those donations, which was no fun at all. Um, so we uh, became a corporation and we now have 501c3 nonprofit status. So all of our donations are tax exempt. Uh, and we we have a board of directors. And we, so we have two missions. One, we want to promote amateur radio in developing nations. And we've done that in places like Iraq where we make presentations. We've gone to Ethiopia and uh, operated from there and made presentations at the uh, Addis Ababa Technology University. Um, We've gone to Rotuma Island and made presentations and, and trained kids on operating there at the high school of Rotuma Island. Um, we we also want to activate rare and remote places, and we do that when we can, how we can. And then we also want to promote youth activity in the, uh, in the hobby. And th we just finished our fourth annual Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest. And um, we we uh, buy uh, radios. Um, ICOM seventy three hundred is the dream rig, and we open this essay contest each year to kids in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, this year we received thirty very very nice essays, and uh, 
we had three different radios as prizes. And so we've just just completed that. And if anyone wants to look at our Intrepid DX Group uh, Facebook page, you can see the winning essays and you can see the kids uh, there with their gleaming radios and their big smiles on their face. And it's very, very rewarding for us. And it, we also like to tap into the to the creativity of these young kids and, and find out what appeals to them about the hobby. And, and interestingly, um, a lot of what appealed to the hobby for us, you know, 40, 50 years ago, still appeals to them today. They're, these kids are, are brimming with great ideas and enthusiasm, and they're not all stuck looking at their phone or their you know, their web browser, whatever, they're thinkers, they're doers. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the, the kids that won uh, second place this year is a, a pre-med student. Um, you know, they're all going places. They're all, they're all really bright, uh, enthusiastic kids. And it's just delightful to read their essays. So I've been posting the winning essays on our Facebook page. If anybody wants to take a look. Yeah, that'd be great. I, and I'll put yeah. that link out there as well. Uh, Jay had mentioned the youth uh, dream rig essay contest. Wanted to make sure I brought it up. So yeah, uh, that's really neat, and that's an annual thing now. That's a that's an annual thing, and uh, we hope to keep it going for many years to come. It's it's we enjoy doing it, and uh, um, you know, at some point we hope we can maybe get a sponsor to help us with the cost of the rigs, and um, you know, we'll just see where it goes. How, how do you make the announcement? Is it posted on Facebook or it's at a dinner or? Uh, we, uh, basically we, we, uh, make a, a, a news announcement. We post it in a lot of youth forums on, uh, Facebook, uh, Carol Perry, the ARRL helps us also, uh, Ray Storms or Jim Storms Jim, yeah. and, um, some of his friends help publicize it. They've got a pretty big youth group. We do the uh, the youth on the air, uh, Yota. We contact them. Um, Neil Rapp uh, helps publicize it. So a lot of different folks uh, have quite a list of people we reach out to. Bernie W3UR helps us with that. So we get the word out and then uh, we open up the 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 essay submission period and and we were delighted to get 30 very well done essays this year that's great that's terrific mm -hmm. um when when you get back and your feet are up you know there's the classic question where you where do you go next well um we're working on a lot of things um we're still trying to activate some stuff in the south pacific again very rare very challenging um I'd love to take a team back to uh, Iraq. Uh, it's been 13 years since I was there. I plan to, to go back to Iraq this year. Um, I was in Syria in August and uh, had some meaningful talks there. Would love to bring a team to Syria. Um, it was very, very, very challenging there for a number of reasons, but it, it, it might happen. Um, that would be a sort of a multinational group, not so much an American effort, but a multinational group. Wow. And, um, the, the, we'll see what happens. Do, do I have your name associated with Korea at some time? Were you almost going to go? Or... <laughs> that was going to be made, my question. <laughs> I've made uh, several visits to North Korea in 2015. And uh, at one point, we had permission and we were assembling a team and we shipped a mountain of gear to Beijing that we would bring into North Korea. And wouldn't you know, at the last minute, uh, things unraveled and uh, complications arose that we just really, you know, it's going back to mitigating risk. We we were faced with uh, unplanned risks at, the, at the, the last moment. It was the hardest decision I ever made uh, in conjunction with Dave Collingham to say things are going south, you know, really fast. Um, we need to, you know, we need to pull back on this and hit the brakes. And wow. it was very, very, very difficult. Um, but, but again, we, we mitigate risk and we were just faced with uh, some enormous risks at the very last moment that weren't very attractive. 
So, so Paul, so, do you think that P5 will ever be on air? You know, I do. I do. I think certain nationalities, maybe the Chinese or the Russians, probably have a, a, an advantage to doing it there. But we know from our experience dealing with the North Koreans that their methods of um, negotiating are, well, let's just say unique. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Interesting. Because well, we're all, I'm one of the lucky ones, I've got it. But um, I always wonder, will it ever, ever, you know, get back on the air? So I, I think it will, but I'll, I'll add that the North Koreans know the value of permission there. They know. And they intend to, they intend to assess uh, as much as they can with that, with that permission. Sure. Well, well mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make you this offer. I'm six nine and about three forty. So if I can be your bodyguard when you go, uh, <laughs> call me. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. There was actually uh, in my two visits there. They were very friendly, very cordial. Uh, they were nice people. They have to follow a very narrow script or you know sort of sure. country line you know um but you know we we had some great meals with the north koreans we drank beer together we played volleyball um we had a really great time you know they as americans they don't project any animus towards us at all they can be very very friendly and very very nice but but when you're negotiating with them as Americans, you're you're at a severe disadvantage just from the get-go. And I think the Chinese or the Russians would have a real advantage there. And I hope that they exploit that advantage. I'd like to see it activated. Yes. And then your trips to the Middle East, you found that to be beneficial at least and um, nice folks, yeah. kind of the same feeling you had? And Yeah. Um, I've been to almost every country in the Middle East and uh, always treated very well over there. Uh, we also went to Iran in 2015, and we had some uh, talks and meetings with the government there, and we learned that they were basically going to sort of auction permission to the highest bidder, uh, and uh, um, we learned that a, a European group was was also interested in activating Iran, and we actually talked to them on the phone from Iran, and um uh, we we they were so honest and so forthright and so decent and we basically said you know it really makes sense for you guys to activate this you're a lot closer you can bring your gear in and out much easier you know to bring stuff from w6 land to iran is very very expensive yeah, you know yeah, we've man. done that before going to iraq we know yeah um so we chose ultimately to to wish them good luck and not bid against them on that permission and they made a very, very successful activation of Iran. I worked them from home and, and everybody was happy. Yeah. Um, partnerships can be really, really beneficial. Um, you know, when we did ST0R in 2011, we partnered with a group called the Tiferiti Gang or dxfriends.com, uh, Tony E5RM and his group. And we had just a wonderful experience, three weeks operate, operating from Juba, South Sudan with the, with the Tiferiti gang and uh, just what a positive experience and, and, you know, friendships that, that last to this day. It was, you know, partnerships can, can really make or break a de expedition. Wow. Yeah. That's really amazing. And it, it, it gives you a sense of, of what a tight community we are, whether we realize it or not, you know? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So what are, what are the dates then uh, for the, um, Timotu, I, I don't even say it correctly, I don't think, but what are the dates for that? Uh, we're going to be on the air late in the day on February 22nd of okay. 2024, and then we'll shut down uh, probably late in the evening, March 6th. On March 7th, we have to fly from Lom Lom back to to uh, Haniara. But, uh, so, so those are the dates, and we've got them on our website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to make sure I get this all this information out yeah. well before then. So I, I'd like to follow back up with the Intrepid group, though. Um, is that a uh, an open group? Anybody that myself or anybody listening can join that group? 
Uh, well, or, we uh, is there a join or? We don't have members per se. I have a list of people on our website that have gone with us on various D expeditions. And that's sort of my bench that I go to when we're forming a team as I, I go to many of those. But on the other side, we always welcome uh, newcomers and first timers on every one of our teams. We've always had a first timer on the Tomoto team. We have a first timer. In fact, our our physician, Bruce, K3 and Q is so excited to go. He's just brimming, brimming with excitement. Uh, he's a snorkeler and a diver like me. And we're we're just super excited to go to Tomoto. You know, the 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 first timers that we've had have always exceeded our expectations. They've always worked out really, really well. Um, a lot of them become very serious de-expeditioners. Arliss Thompson, for example, W7XU, South Georgia and South Sandwich was his first de-expedition. And now he's gone to all sorts of places and he's he's very busy. He's, he's got a full dance card with the expeditions. He's very much in demand. Um, and he did the hard ones first. Boy, yes, he did. He, did. Yeah. he really did. Yeah. <laughs> Holy yeah. moly. So, Joe, what, what have I forgotten? Well, I don't know. I, I went down through my list and I made some notes while Paul was talking and we've covered all of them. So I, I don't have anything to add, I, I, uh, Bill. Okay. <clears throat> well, Paul, I really appreciate you taking time and my goodness, looking at your schedule coming up and um, uh, we hope to see you at Dayton, of course. And uh, um, can, I'll try to make it. That's yeah, my plan. We'll, we'll yeah. compare notes there and uh um, anything else you'd like to add or e either about what we've talked about or something that has slipped my mind? You know, in closing, I would just like to say that, um, you know, there's some really terrific organizations and companies out there that sponsor our de-expeditions that really, really bolster our abilities and really add to that success factor. Uh, Tim Duffy and the great folks at DX Engineering are second to none. Um, just amazing people. And when we contact them, uh, they're, they are very generous and really help us a lot. Um, some of the manufacturers out there too, great people. They want to see us be successful. Over the years, we've benefited a lot. And then of course, the foundations and the many DX clubs across the country, you know, we're, we're only successful because they add to uh, our mission. You know, they, they, they put the wind in our sails and we're very, very grateful for all of them. Yeah. They're, they're really critical to the whole process. That's for sure. Very much so. Well, we'll, we'll get the word out. And if there's anything we can do, uh, Joe and I let me know. And uh, of course we got Jay close by here so we can, yeah. um, I can not, not quite see him from here. He's a few miles away, but um, we'll keep tabs on you guys. And, you know, and I'd like to right now invite you back when you get home and things are settled and your bags are not are unpacked, but not quite packed yet. And I'll be glad to. Yeah, we'll do a recap. Yeah. So, yeah. Paul, thank you very much. Um, God bless. And, uh, well, you know, we'll pray for a safe trip and, and good DX. So uh, you can't wish for a whole lot more than that. We'll see thank you. In you Bill. Joe. We'll, we'll see you in the pile ups. Yeah, yeah. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Great. Sir. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. You yeah, too. thank you. Okay. Safe travels. Bye-bye. 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 Was that cool or what? Talking to Paul just before he left for this major de-expedition. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the DX Mentor. I would also like to thank our gurus on the podcast, Paul, N6PSE, and Joe, W8GEX. I would love to have your feedback, answer your questions, and provide help with any DX or amateur radio issues that you may have. If you need clarification on something or you just have a question or a comment, email me at thedxmentor at gmail.com. Please drop me a line if you've achieved an all-time new one, received recognition, or have a DX event that you would like us to mention. We'd be happy to do that. If you are enjoying the DX Mentor podcast, please hit the subscribe button. You can also click like if you found this one to be particularly interesting. If you don't want to subscribe, please drop me a note and let me know why. I want to make it something you want to listen to and watch. 7-3 for this episode, and thanks to my XYL Karen for her love and support. I hope to see you in the pileups.